Ajax moved top of Group C with a comfortable victory over Borussia Dortmund. Ajax dominated the game and created plenty of chances, while Haaland came close on a few occasions. In the end, the game finished 4-0 to the home team. Dortmund lined up in a 4-3-3 with Haaland leading the line. Ajax had a 4-2-3-1 on paper, with the impressive Haaland leading the line. But as you'll see from the average positions, this was a very flexible 4-2-3-1. The fullbacks pushed forward hugging the touchlines, making the pitch as big as possible. And only one of the pivots played defensively in possession. Dortmund on the other hand were very much narrower. Ajax dominated the game with 56% possession. They also created 18 shots, with 9 of them on target. The XG shows us that Ajax were worthy winners with an XG of 2.13 compared to Dortmund's 1.23 so Dortmund were a little wasteful in front of goal. Ajax with their total football philosophy would play short passes out from the keeper as much as possible. The team's two pivots would split, with Gravenberg moving towards the forwards to link play. Alvarez would remain as a single pivot, while the two fullbacks pushed up as Ajax formed a 2-3-1-4 formation. The ball would go to the centre-backs, and with Dortmund very narrow, they would be able to find passes into their fullbacks in space either side of Dortmund's midfield. With Gravenberg in this position, it gave him the freedom to join the attacks at times. And with him moving forward, it meant that Ajax could outnumber Dortmund's four-man defence as the midfielders were often slow in tracking him. Ajax's width gave Dortmund a lot of problems in the game. Ajax's movement was too much for Dortmund. Here the fullback moves between the lines into Dortmund's back line, creating an extra player. This then allows the winger to find space outside, taking the defender with him. The fullback is now in space to get a cross in, which is narrowly missed by Hala. Ajax were great in possession, but they were also good out of possession. By pressing high, they stopped Dortmund playing the ball into the midfielders. This then left Haaland very isolated up front, although this is often when Haaland is at his most dangerous, here latching on to a long ball and forcing the keeper into a great save. On the occasions that Dortmund could beat Ajax's press, they would sit back in a low block forming a 5-4-1 with only Haller forward. Dortmund found this hard to beat as they did not get enough players forward. Ajax were very effective down the right hand side. Anthony would hold his position out wide, and with Masraoui finding space in the midfield, he could join the attacks, creating a 5 versus 4, as Witzel was slow in tracking the runner. This created another low cross in the box and a shot on target. Dortmund would try to play the ball out from the keeper to their centre-backs, who would then try to feed the ball to Witzel, but because of Ajax's high press, they were often forced to play the ball back to the keeper, who would then kick long to the fullback that has moved up. In possession, Dortmund would move their fullbacks up the pitch, but unlike Ajax, they would have two pivots protecting the centre-backs. This gave them less options going forward. Haaland was left a lone striker. One of the midfielders, usually Bellingham, would move up as Dortmund attacked in a 2-4-3-1 shape. The role of the three was to get through balls to Haaland. Out of possession, Dortmund also chose a 5-4-1, but compared with Ajax, was sitting much deeper. After winning back possession, Dortmund were very narrow when in possession. Dortmund would rely on through balls to Haaland from the midfield, and this was easy for Ajax to defend. Conclusion to this game? Whereas Ajax's game plan was clear to dominate the ball and make the pitch as big as possible, Dortmund's game plan was not evident here. They seemed to rely on three balls to Haaland, but without an effective pressing strategy, these chances were very few and far between.